Party people in the place to be is the BKMC Talib Kweli. I am still at my secret trap house somewhere on earth, hosting the people's party from remote fly locations. I want to give a big extra large shout out to my wonderful, lovely, thoughtful, talented co-host Jasmine Lee. Give it up for Jasmine Lee in the place to be. What up, Jasmine? Yay, what's up? How you feeling? I'm feeling great. Good. Just I'm had glad. myself a nice bagel. A nice bagel? Okay. Mm-hmm. That's the New Yorker in you coming out. Yes, with cream cheese, baby. Okay. Well, I'm glad that you're excited about your bagel. I'm excited about today's <laughs> guest. Today's guest is one of the most exciting guests we've ever had on People's Party. This is one of the most influential, inspirational people in my life as an artist. He put together one of the most defining bands of the 20th century mm -hmm. um, as a solo artist. He's released so many albums, like 13 albums, I think. He's got so many classic songs. He's a producer whose talents have been sought out by everyone from Carlos Santana to Shakira to Whitney Houston. His influence today is everywhere from Young Thug to Beyonce. His style, his energy, it's changed the course of hip hop. It's changed the way we, we talk about hip hop. And on top of that, I just find this man to be a very sincere uh, human being. Um, one of the hardest working men in the show, in the business. Um, this is the man who's responsible for the score. I think the score is like triple diamond right now. And as somebody from Brooklyn, which is a Caribbean community, this man put it down for his Haitian brothers and sisters. He is a rapper that really represented Haiti to the fullest. The king of the carnival. Give it up for Wyclef Jean in the house. What? Yeah. What up, family? What's How up, are Wyclef? you? How you doing? Man, listen, if I was giving you an introduction, I, I uh -huh. think it would take like three hours, just so you know. <laughs> oh. um, when when, you, when I got when I got the call, I was just so excited. I mean, you know how much of a fan I am of yours. Um, mm -hmm. I got a chance to not only perform with you at times, but have conversations mm -hmm. with you. And yes. I think you're one of the most influential um, human beings on the planet. You know what I mean? Oh, so man. respect to you. Respect to you, brother. Um, one thing that I need people to know about Wyclef going in is like what you just said. We've had a lot of conversations between you and I. We perform together. Yeah. And you are responsible for over 100 million records sold. You are a huge mm -hmm. global star. But even at the sort of height of the Fuji success, I would see you in all the underground spots and not just like the underground nightclubs where you have the velvet ropes and they serve a champagne, but like the lyricist lounge. And mm -hmm. you're the type of artist that no matter how much money you make, how much success you had in the business, if there was a cypher going on, you jumping in the cypher, you feel the need <laughs> to create and be active and present in the, in the art, uh, no matter how much money you make. So you have this record out distance which is about quarantining um mm -hmm. how do you just find the motivation like for people who think that once people achieve your level of success there's no reason to just keep working how do you find the motivation well the motivation for me really came from a high school teacher i mm -hmm. came from haiti when i was 10 years old i grew up in extreme poverty um i was born in a hut so I say by the time I got to the projects, I done moved on up like the Jeffersons, you dig? So, <laughs> yes, and Marlboro Hope Projects in Brooklyn, in Coney mm -hmm. Island um, at the time. And mm -hmm. at the time in Coney Island, there was a lot of wars going on. Like if you came from the Caribbean, you couldn't speak English. So I watched my cousins get deported, shot, you know, fired, all kind of things. And, and I was headed in the wrong route. My father was a minister. And he moved us to New Jersey. He always believed in like building churches within a community. <clears throat> but in the church in the hood, what was good was like every week there'd be a new instrument. You know what I'm saying? And, mm. and so we the church band, me and my brothers and my sisters. So if the organ come in, you know, we got to figure out how to play that. The drum come in. We got it. So I said by the time I was 16, I had like my hands on like 10 different instruments, like just mm. self-taught. But to your point earlier, the reason why I got into hip hop was because I didn't want to get killed, right? Because, mm -hmm. you know, I'm really zoned up like for real. Like, yeah. I was that kid when I came from Haiti and I stood on the roof 
of Marlboro projects. I said, one way or another, I'm going to get my mom out of this. You know, and when I tell you to watch my cousin, one of my cousins got gunned down in front of Erasmus High School. So Mm -hmm. for me, one, one day, man, I saw two kids up on each other's faces and they were saying all kind of stuff about each other's mamas, you know, all kind of jokes. And I was like, yo, why are they not fighting? This is interesting. And my man was like, yo, this is battle rap. Like you could just <laughs> joust with words and, you know, gangs go home and everything's fine. It's like breakdancing. So I was like, you know what? <laughs> I'm going to learn this. And so I learned how to battle rap at a very young age, just so I wouldn't have to fight as much. And I, I'm trying to find a way out. And uh, so by the time I'm 16, I'm in Velsberg High School. I'm in an auditorium and I'm playing piano, just doodling with the piano. But I got my bubble goose on, my scully. And a music teacher comes in and she goes, where did you learn those chords? And I was like, I could just hear them in my head. And she was like, close your eyes. What do you see? And I've never read sheet music in my life. And I was like, well, in the left hand, I could see the math. I see one five. I don't even know what I'm talking about. And I was in the right hand. I see one, three, five. So what I did was I I was learning theory in reverse. So, you know, as the Asiatic, there's things that we naturally know without knowing. And she was like, she was like, you're starting jazz tomorrow. And I was like, I am not starting jazz. I'm going to be a battle rapper. (laughs) And she was like, and I'll never forget. She was like, do you know how much money they're going to pay? You're going to have to pay somebody after you do your music. And then they got to write the sheet music for you. And I was like, how much? She was like 25,000. I was like, what? Where do I sign up? And (laughs) Mm -hmm. that teacher at a very young age, what she taught me was the music of business was to learn all aspects about it, right? So a lot of us come in the industry wanting to be on the radio. A lot of us come in, and then once you're not on the radio no more, you feel like, oh, it's my career's over. A lot of us come in more wanting to be famous. So with the Fugees, when we was coming in, the ideology was like, let's be a band, right? Mm-hmm. And, you know, when you look at the Rolling Stones and the Beatles and different bands, when you once you're a band, the love for a band is different. So I would say... I, I just loved all aspects of the game. And I always tell people, I really ain't want to be famous. What made the Fugees incredible, and people don't talk about it, was the Fugees was like stacks, man. And what mm-hmm. that mean was, there's a lot of names you hear about, but there's names that you don't hear about. So I want to clarify this on, on your podcast, which is very, very important that I state this. John Forte... John Forte, so because it's important, like when we document history, we mm-hmm. really explain to it. So I'm going to explain to you it too, like in a jazz form. So mm-hmm. for me, I I love Quincy Jones, you know, and I was like, I'm inspired to be Quincy Jones. You know, Lauren had loved Nina Simone, you know, Jerry loved Bootsy Collins, right? John Forte to me, um, his participation in the score was like a modern day Miles Davis, because he bought something and every time we talk, and of course the great Salam Remy, but we yeah. never mention John Forte. And I would say me coming from the church, um, mm-hmm. it was so important that we state history. Um, I could say like, I learned a lot from John Forte. Um, before John Forte, I was programming drums more like a church way. And watching how John started cutting samples in a way, it made me like, oh, man, I got to get my, my my sample game up. But when I saw the way John Forte was chopping up the drums, I was like, hold on, hold on. I have to get this side of the game up because, uh, and I would say a lot of the street sounds and how to the, to roughen it up. Uh, if John Forte was not in that basement, I don't think that that would have happened. So it's so important that I credit him um, in the course of history, in the books, um, and in saying that, you know, I was the kid that always wanted to create the star. I felt like if I create the star, I always have a job. I would <laughs> be more, I would be more interested in wanting to do the movie score. I was the kid that would watch the movie Once Upon a Time in America silently and put all the music in my head. So it's just the love for right. the music, you know. That's the name of score of the album. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it makes sense. And sure. Once Upon a Time in America, boy, there's some good performances in that. Um, yeah. 
you know, De Niro, James Woods, you know, even though he's crazy. But um, yeah, it's interesting you say, I, I know that you know that me and John Forte are close, but I don't know, know if you really know how deep what you just said to me is because John Forte is my musical mentor. Without uh-huh. John Forte in my life, I would not have a career. John Forte produced my first demo tape. John Forte taught me how to rap on a mic. He taught, he's the first one that brought me into a studio. When I was, when you talk about being in the Booger Basement, I was in that Booger Basement because John Forte mm-hmm. brought me to the Booger mm-hmm. Basement while y'all were working on that album. Yeah. And so I'm so glad that you said that, brother, because obviously I was going to ask you about John Forte just because he's the homie, but for you to bring it, bring it up in that way is just, it's just excellent. Yeah. And I, but you know, you know what, to your point, if we don't paint history, Mm -hmm. then someone else is going to paint it for us. And when we look at the greats, it's not just one person, right? When we look at the walls, we see Quincy, we see Sinatra, we see Dizzy Gillespie, we see Miles. So and sometimes when things explode, right, Mm -hmm. um, for it to explode, it has to come from a basic atom, right? And from Mm -hmm. this atom, it happens. And it's so important that people understand. I mean, we talk about Salam. We all know how great the monk is. But mm-hmm. within the space of, of, of Salam, it's so important that people understand. John Forte, grab the John mic and we'll swear this way. Yeah. Yeah, man. <laughs> Shout out to John Forte. Shout out to John Forte. He just had a, 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 a baby. I think he had a daughter or a son. I'm not sure. It's a new, it's a forgive me, John, if you watch this. There's a new baby in his life. I'll get it Respect right in a couple to months. John. Right. <laughs> yeah. Respect. Um, now, Clef, earlier you were talking about, you said you were zoned up. For people who don't know what that means, can you break that down? Well, first of all, I want to give a big shout out to Makazo, who's doing a double life sentence in prison. And I feel like he's a political prisoner. And mm-hmm. I say that because when you look at the situation with Pablo Escobar and after Escobar passed away, there's a, a dude, if you watch on Netflix, I think his name is Poppy or Poppy. He was a soldier for Escobar. And the way he got out, he said, I was serving the president, you know? Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, I feel that at the time that Mac went in, we wasn't talking prison reform, you know? Mm -hmm. And the idea of really looking at the cases and what people go in. So within the states, the way that someone would say a crip is a gang or Mm -hmm. blood is a gang, which I totally disagree with, I call it tribes Mm -hmm. and at the end of the day, understanding who Tookie is, you know, um, one of the leaders uh, of the LA. Crips. Yeah. Yes. But having a chance to spend time with Nelson Mandela and understanding uh, Mandela's wife at the time, but, but, you know, petitioning so Tookie wouldn't get the electric chair. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it makes you understand the level. So for me, when the sense of saying like I'm zoned up, it means like, you know, the zo is a word that means bones, like mm-hmm. to my core. Like I'm revolution up, you know, I'm revolutioned yeah. up. You know, the principle comes first. The character comes first before anything. So when you see me at the Grammys and I would not go on unless I had a Haitian flag. And the reason right. that is, is at the end of the day, you know, we know how many people bust their guns on Flatbush. But that mm-hmm. day, if you look back at the Grammys, I'm wearing a Haitian flag. Steve Marley has a Jamaican flag. We wanted to bring a unity with the Jamaicans and the Haitians to stop yeah. a lot of the war that was going on. So when we say like we zoned up, it's like saying we Marcus Garvey'd up. You know what I mean? Yes. Yes. And you uh, referenced some of this in in Creole in the San Fazi res- record, right? Yeah. So so here, here, here you go. And and. I'm going to say stuff here that no one has heard because okay. I can tell you because it's like the information needs to be in your show. So okay. Safi Z is a coded record that says telling the dudes on the streets do not walk without their guns, right? Mm-hmm. So what I was doing, right, was because I came to America and my mama said, once you get caught, you remember, you have a green card. You're going to get deported, right? Mm-hmm. So I was very, very careful in my messaging, right? So Safi Z is as hard as the warning by Biggie. Biggie. It's the same like message, like who the hell? So New York which Haitian is going to tell me to walk to, in New York without my gun? Umati, you lying. Because... When the dudes catch us, they rob us. And it's after that that the cops show up. So basically, you know, at 20-something years old, I was like, yo, do not get caught 
without your burner. I didn't want to say that in English because right. the message was not, I, I wasn't sending, the message was a cryptic for Haitians at the time that I felt was getting robbed, you know? Yes, yes, definitely. Um, now, I see it says, we're talking to you, it says the preacher's iPhone. And you speak about your father being a preacher and you have an album called Preacher's Son. You're named after a biblical scholar and theologian named John w John Wycliffe. Um, what traits do you feel like the children of preachers generally share that you've seen? Um, I think like the traits that we share is we really like, a lot of people say we're like we're bad boys and bad girls, mm -hmm. right? They automatically be like, you don't want to mess with no preacher kid, right? right. Because we got nothing to lose. Because mm -hmm. literally, like, our whole life is constantly, you know, people eyeballing us. Anything we do, they overlooking it. They making it bigger than it is. So we naturally are constantly defending ourselves. You know what I mean? And mm -hmm. I would say that uh, preacher kids are very fearless. You know what I'm saying to you? Um, yeah. At the end of the day, um, you ain't going to punk no preacher's kid. Um, mm -hmm. And naturally... We have a fear for God and the fear for God in the supreme being in the sense is I'm just using the word God. Some may use the word Elohim, El Shaddai, Allah, but the highest form of supreme being, the, the cause to understand that there is something bigger than you, right? Because I am 50 years old. So what happens when I am 27 and I'm in a room, cocaine is all over the room, right? And you literally have a million dollars on the bed. So what 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 stops you from doing that, right? So it's like it's that little fear in me that my dad gave me that uh, that Jimmy Swagger book at the time. You know what I'm saying to you? So <laughs> like I think I like we have yeah yeah we had that natural little that fear for God. I'd say you know. Um, as you said, your family immigrated from Haiti to Brooklyn, and then later y'all settled in Newark. Um, how did your Brooklyn experience influence you and how did your Jersey experience influence you? That's a, a great question. And it's like, it's always a, a war. Like, yo, he from Brooklyn. No, he from Jersey. And <laughs> so I credit that to my grandma. So my grandma, we moved to Brooklyn and every week we had to be in Brooklyn to see my grandma. And I would tell you that the traits that I got from Brick Brooklyn was very witty, very sharp, um, to, to, to read the room. Like Brooklyn mm. teaches you like to walk and to constantly be on your guard. Don't talk, like really look before you speak and understand um, what's around you. You know what I mean? And I would say Newark, New Jersey just showed me opportunity. It shows, mm. showed me if I worked hard, um, I could definitely get it. You know what I mean? I remember um, when I saw um, Amir Baraka and I, I went Newark, to his house. Newark, uh, and the, Newark uh, representative, born and raised in Newark. Well, I don't know if he was born in Newark, but made his home and raised his kids in Newark. And his son, yeah. Ross Baraka, the homie, uh, yeah. is now the mayor of Newark for context for people. Yeah, definitely. And he's also the narrator on the score. That's right. The, 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 yeah, that's right. yeah, yeah. So, so for me, it was, I just felt like Newark was so much opportunity. I was getting inspired by a lot of what was coming out of Newark. When you look at your imprint of your personal history of music, what makes you feel like that's Haiti or that's Brooklyn or that's Jersey? Uh, I just feel like I've never looked at it like that's Brooklyn, that's Jersey. At a very young age, I understood there was a leader, the first black general by the name of Toussaint Louverture. And in 1804, when Haiti got its independence, defeating the Napoleon army, at a very young age, I just understood that we are the power. And what, I, what do I mean by we are the power? And the power comes from the struggle, right? And what does that mean? The power comes from the struggle. It was something, I'm going to tell you something real funny. So one day someone said to me when President Barack Obama was president, how do you feel about the first black president? I said, uh, I don't feel uh, no way. Like I'm used to it because where I'm from, all I know is black presidents. It only makes mm. sense that he's the president. You know what right. I mean? So, so for me, I would say that understanding the revolution of 1804, it makes me understand like who we are as a people, as a unit. I don't put no separation with me and you. The only separation they did was when they put us through that water coastline um, and it yeah. put you in one place and me in my one place. So like I'm in a booger basement and I'm doing ready or not. I sample Enya. Enya lives in a castle in Europe, right? 
I, I'm from the hood in Newark. Like, I don't know no Enya. But for me, that's how vast I did music. Like, I never thought of, like, let me put it in a certain area. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, I think mm-hmm. it's in- interesting. I was listening to those uh, Enya records before you sampled them. Um, uh-huh. And so when I heard what, Ready or Not, I'm like, oh, I know what that is. And Enya yeah. initially tried to, or her or the record company tried to sue you. But then she heard the Fugees wasn't no gangster rap group. So y'all got to pass on that one. Um, is that a true story? Yeah, definitely. I would say um, the combination with Enya, you know, uh, being John Wycliffe and the son of a preacher and a reformatator who understands that, I think that really helped us a lot. Yeah. Um, Louverture, you just mentioned, uh, has a quote. I want to quote him. In overthrowing me, you have cut down only the trunk of the tree of liberty. It will spring up again from the roots, for they are numerous and they are deep. Um the Haitian Revolution, beyond the fact that there's a nativist movement, not just in like MAGA land, but like in African-American communities, there's a native nativist move, movement where they're angry at Haitians, angry at, at Nigerians in particular. But I feel like Haiti has always been demonized by white supremacist structures and white supremacist systems because they were the first, Haitians were the first black people to resist the white supremacist status quo in an efficient, effective way. And as a result, Haitians all over the diaspora are, are you know, disparaged. Um, do you feel like the revolution in Haiti sort of mirrors or what's happening now over George Floyd? Well, I mean, that's definitely a good question. And the way that I could start that is I was a candidate to become president of Haiti. Mm-hmm. And... Mm-hmm. If you notice, they try to give me a modern day lynching. Like mm-hmm. they took me around the world and attempt to try to crucify me. But it would, in order for you to do that, you would have to turn my own people around against me. Not the people that are living here, the people that's in my actual land. And you couldn't do that because mm-hmm. the unification and as a leader, they believed that that was real. Right. So, and what do I mean by that? What, what that means is the Haitians in Haiti, France don't own it, England don't own it, America don't own it. So the idea of in Haiti, a policeman literally taking a knee and putting it on someone and there's a camera shooting it and a group of people looking, right? They couldn't even fathom that thought mm-hmm. in 2020. The policeman would have ended up in 33 shred pieces Mm -hmm. because the idea of, and this is why they demonize us. Because at the end of the day, when you have people that believe in real revolution and people should not be oppressed. And the idea was, what happens if the Haitian comes to America and we build that ideology? So what they do is they suppress us in many ways. Another way is they use the idea of voodoo and create a movie called Serpent and the Rainbow. Mm -hmm. And when you look at this movie and the way they portray it, you have to think of how they used to portray black folks and have them eating watermelons, right? There's no difference in that. It's just that whenever they sense that there's a form of power, they are going to try to uh, uh, put you down. And what I want people to understand is in the case of Floyd, right? The what, Floyd represents, right? At the end of the day, um, you know, you're always going to have two sides of a debate, right? Mm -hmm. Right? And what's wrong? Yes. But what is wrong is the idea of a modern day lynching. And all I Mm -hmm. want people to know is imagine what wasn't caught on camera. Meaning like, can you imagine how many brothers and sisters? I was in LA. Y'all can look this up. Police stop me. They ran up on you. Ran up on me. I got my, my, my Haitian bandana. Half of it is red. The other half is blue. They go some, they say a blood just robbed the gas station. So uh, now it's me. So mm. they run out of the car. I don't see no uniform or nothing. I don't have my gun on me. What you think my first reaction is going to be? I'm getting jacked. How can I get away? And mm. when you look at the report, they go, oh, Clef was going for something in the back of his trunk. Luckily, I was alive to speak on that. But this is what goes on modern day, every day. Just the power of someone catching it on camera changes the game. That's right. It's very important for us to note that being wealthy or being rich or having a class status does not stop racism. 
Um, you know, this happened to you. Uh, LeBron James, they paint nigger on the side of his house. He worth half a billy. It doesn't matter how rich you are as a black man, you still face racism. So that's a very, very good point. Um, so speaking back about Haiti, so growing up in New York City, that demonization was very powerful. It was very insidious. And it started in our communities first. I grew up in a Caribbean community. Haitians were demonized in that community by other Caribbean people. I grew up around Haitian people who were ashamed to say they were Haitian. They would pretend they were Jamaican. Now, you spoke about being on the stage with you and, and Stephen Marley and how he had the Jamaica flag and you had the Haiti flag and the tension. I've heard you speak before about the tension between Haitian and, and, and Jamaican communities and other communities, particularly in Brooklyn, in Flatbush. Um, I remember the jokes, the HBO. Um, I think there's a rapper out now, I forget his name, who took that, a Haitian rapper, who took that HBO a uh, Haitian body odor, make it, made it a mixtape, you know, so uh, I think it's good for people to flip those images. But um, how important was it for you and, and Praz and, and to to change that image? Because I think we can all agree that after the Fugees dropped, the Fugees releasing as a group and becoming a famous group changed the narrative and changed the paradigm for how people treated Haitian people in these communities. I mean, definitely, I would say anybody that knows me knows from the gate. Whether you're talking to Mona Scott, talking to Sha Kim, you could talk Kango Kid, the Shaq original. Yeah. Yeah. Like, for me, like, it's just when I was looking how the West Coast represent, and I was like, look how Dr. Dre and Snoop is putting the coast on the line. Like, when I saw, like, what y'all was doing in Brooklyn, like what Jay-Z was doing in Brooklyn, mm -hmm. all of that inspired me. And I was like, I'm going to make Haiti fly. Because at the end of the day, okay. we are fly. And then I was like, I'm going to make Haiti fly. Not for me, but for the next generation to come. The same way when mm -hmm. Tucson was in a dungeon, he said, do what you do with me. The seeds have been planted. I didn't know what reaction I would get while I was alive, right? But I knew that the next generation, when they are to come, because, you know, we didn't have Michael Jackson, right? We didn't have, it was mm -hmm. like, why Clef literally the first Haitian on that kind of plateau to sell all of those kind of records, right? So mm -hmm. what can I do with that? So now a young kid who's like seven or eight, he's like, I got Y Clef Jump, right? That's his version of a Jay-Z, right? Of, of a kid who's like from a certain, yo, that's his version of Tali Kwali. So at the end of the day, what we did was, I was very conscious of that at a very young age because fam, when I tell you how many of us is deported, how many mm -hmm. of us got killed, how many of us was in... So the movement for me was similar to Barb Marley in Kingston. It was like, mm -hmm. I did, I never looked at music like I'm just going to sing a song. I never, I do music every day. Like, I, I don't think of here's an album I'm about to do music because I know that the music is supposed to move people as a cause. So for me, that unification, nothing beats that. And I think that the world is better. Brooklyn is better. Jersey's better. I think that whole movement, it unified the entire Caribbean a little more. Yes, it did. Uh, Translator Crew was your first name that became the Fugees, which was to, you know, take back the power from the word refugee, which was used as an insult to um, aimed at Haitians. In uh, 45's America, we're still seeing refugee as a politicized term. How do you feel the president has treated refugees and immigrants in this country? Well, I think that bigger than the president, right? Because as a, a, a man that has ran for office, what I always tell people is <clears throat> we always speak of the president, but I want to speak of something bigger than the president. And what's bigger than the president is the idea of legislation that's ran through an entire house, right? And what that means is we have mayors, we have senators, we have governors, right? So at the end of the day, <clears throat> when we don't like what a leader is doing, in order to have any form of influence as a unit, what we have to do is look at our mayors, our senators, who's in mm -hmm. our area, justifying it. So I feel that the leaders, period, do not do a great job at representing the people. Like, failed policies have failed, like, these rural communities over and over again. So mm -hmm. when I say the idea of a refugee... A refugee to me is like Chicago. You know what I'm saying? It's like mm -hmm. Haiti. It could be Sudan. It's the idea of a failed state, right? But more so than the people that you call failed, how did we fail? We failed through these policies. So what I want everyone to understand is the Art of War is a good book, right? 
because you have to understand distraction is very tricky. And I feel a lot of what's going on is as we screaming and we assume that we're putting fire out on one side, there's another door and they run it right through us. And I think that in order to prevent that, I want, have you ever went to a community where they want our votes and you literally sat and asked somebody from the projects, what's a Democrat? What's a Republican? Mm-hmm. Like, it's like at the end of the day, I feel that we have so much teaching to do within our communities. And mm-hmm. I think that comes from leaders that we appoint because presidents come and they go every four years, every eight years, they come and they go. But these leaders we put inside of our community, we have to be really sure that they're affecting real change moving forward. I want to pivot back to music for a second. Uh, I have a theory that Puffy's for the children, but Wyclef is the Puffy for the underground. Because <laughs> I feel like I feel like you, or especially on the score, you repurposed classics that we knew and hits that we knew. But Puffy would repurpose these hits and rap about champagne and partying. You would give us familiar samples in the production, but rap like from the voice of an underground rap dude, like like you rapping in a cypher. Um, you know, I just recently recently listened to uh, Letter to Cannabis. Um, yes. I feel like you reached out to Cannabis and wanted to work with him because you recognize him as a pure MC. You understand the battle culture. Um, you, you, you were inspired by Raucous. You put Foul Munch. You used Simon Says and put Foul Munch on your record like at the height when you was rolling out. Can you talk to me about how you were influenced by the underground and that ruckus aesthetic? Well, I'm influenced by ruckus because as a jazz major, you know, I think that what people have to understand is I'm like a real jazz head. Like I just posted someone on the gram where at Carnegie Hall, you know, I'm like, you must take the A train to go mm-hmm. to Sugar Way up in Harlem. If you, you know, so ruckus for me represents like, that purity, right? And what we mean about, because a lot of people, I don't think they understand, like when people say underground rap, like what does that mean? Like when Mm -hmm. when people hear that, I think like they associate it like that's the bottom of the tier, the side of it that will not be commercialized. No, that's the side of it that allows universities now to have real hip hop courses Mm. where you actually get real credit from it. So the best way to explain to you is Thelonious Monk, when alive, he was playing all kinds of things, even after studying a structure of institution. He would always break the mold. And the actual party that be that decides, you know, who's great and who's not at the time they didn't think Monk was all that, you know? That's right. And 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 now Monk is what we study in all of all all, all of the, the schools. So the idea of the best way I can explain underground rap is Shakespeare literally took the English language and has defined it. And mm-hmm. and he put it into a way where we call it the, the Queen's language. So what what underground rap does is it takes the language of English and it spits it back out where each community now has their own language. Mm. And 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 for me, it's so important that people understand that and don't associate it with like, oh, to be underground. They 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 put you in a space of like that's because you can't go commercial. No, because. You know, we've seen a lot of what's from the underground rises to a level of commercialism. But when you're from the underground, it literally means like you from that school of jazz and you mm-hmm. could take it anywhere. You know what I mean? If you mm-hmm. ain't from the underground, you can't take it anywhere. You know? Yeah, man. Me and Most Def, when we did a Black Star, we saw ourselves as as like Miles and, and Coltrane and we saw ourselves in the jazz aesthetic. And to quote yeah. Most Def, he said, I I tried to speak the king's English, but caught a rash on my lips. So now my chat just like this. That speaks yeah. to what you're just saying. Yeah. Of course, the genius. Uh, Fuji Law, the first single off the score, starts on, starts with, we used to be number 10, but now we're permanent number one. How did you know that the score was special? Well, I, I, I knew that coming from a hut in Haiti and getting to Brooklyn, <clears throat> one thing 
is when you want it, you must believe it and speak it, right? Mm-hmm. The Manifest. power of, of, of hip hop is so strong. I don't understand people. I, I, people have to understand the power of words, right? Mm-hmm. So we see words like painted in all of these weird, like Hollywood movies, right? So when the legions is going to a fight, right? Can you imagine the head of the legion? These people are going to their death. And he's like, yo, tonight we all are going to dine in Hades, <laughs> right? Right, And right. everyone's like, yo, it's going down. That's the power of words. So the mm-hmm. key is I believed it and mm-hmm. I felt it. And at the end of the day, if you go through the course of hip hop, this is a question you ask so many rappers. How did they know that? All the way to, you know, you've seen lyrics where a rapper is going to die and he predicts how he's going to die. And yeah. he dies like that. So for me, this is the power of words. And I say, we can't um, underestimate that. Um, I'll tell you the cool thing about Fuji Lot, which you do not know. Mm-hmm. So shout out to Fat Joe. So Salam Remy, one of the monks, had that beat for Fat Joe. And Fat Joe was going to record the beat. When we went in the studio, we heard the beat. So we hijacked Fat Joe's beat. So yes. Fuji Lot is originally... <laughs> For the great fat Joe. <laughs> that makes sense. And Salam Remy is definitely a monk. I'm glad that you referred to him as a monk. And you were you also referred to Thelonious Monk. It's not it's not a coincidence. Yeah, definitely. I call I called um Salam uh, like Thelonious Monk because his theory, he lived be in between the scales. And you know, he he did a lot of things where a lot of his fusion, like you can hear a lot of jazz fusion in it that's not really supposed to go together you know so when you have like amy winehouse when you see Mm -hmm. her documentary and she's like on the phone and she's telling salam i have these ideas in my head and he has a way like in his brain like his algorithm is just totally different on how he sees it and how he spits it um let's talk about prize for a second now prize is, is your family right yeah definitely so I, I think like there's always a, a, a misconception with 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 like me and prize, you know what I mean? Even like when I was running for president, he didn't support me. He went on the <laughs> other side, and then later right, we right. come. Right, right. There's always like a, a thing with like um, you know, and at times, you know, like y'all might heard I check prize on a record, you know, mm-hmm. a different thing. It's like at the end of the day, um. What I want everybody to understand, I really feel success is real tricky. This is so important for people to understand that, right? I don't feel the kids that we were in the basement were them same kids, right? Okay. And what I mean by that, right? In the basement, we was eating those chicken wings, extra fried, right? We was, we was, the hunger was completely different. Mm -hmm. And as the money started to come, it changes everybody, right? Because when you go from not being able to get on a phone call to everybody wanting to talk to you, right? Mm -hmm. And there's something that people say, they'd be like, yo, I don't understand why they're spending millions of dollars per second. If you have the money, it's a different thing because in the church, they tell you, they talk about the devil and they talk Mm -hmm. about it in music terms. Um, Like, yo, you don't want to serve the devil. And I think that there's a part of prize, right, that I've watched, you know, from high school to as we grow up, right? I don't think, I think that the pressure of prize was different than the pressure of me and Lauren. And -hmm. I could speak like that. I'm 50 years old. You know what I'm Mm -hmm. saying? It's like Mm -hmm. I'm leveled off. And... I got to go back to the 20s and understand that. It always yeah. looked like Prize had to prove himself extra. Like in a band where you literally have, you know, it always makes seems like when I look back at it, the pressure that he endured at a young age is different, right? Because do you want to always be, it's almost like, they talk about me, they talk about Lauren. And then when they speak of prize, it's almost like at times they make it seem like he's irrelevant. 
Yeah. Right. I mean, it's it's interesting because that's actually part of the question because I know that you have to know intimately what prize brought to the group better than the fans know. Um, and so that's that's what I wanted to sort of get from you. Like, what was Praz's role to the group? Because when you listen to the records, he had the shortest verses on the records. When you listen to Stay Alive, he says, you know, why Clef about the tracks, I'm about that tax. You know, when, when you see the Vlad TV interviews, they ask him questions about relationships, and he's like, I was focused on the money. So mm. the, the narrative is that Praz was the money man. Is that an accurate narrative? Yeah, I think that... Me and Lauren, we only had one focus. Mm -hmm. It was the music, mm -hmm. right? And I think that, let me explain to you the best way for Prize. <clears throat> Prize was the executive producer, right? Mm -hmm. So when he's telling you, look, my focus was the money, right? Similar to Barry. So if Barry Gordy says, oh, I found um, mm -hmm. Smokey Robinson and I find Nina Simone, I'm giving you an example. And I, if I put them together... We could make a trail. You know what I'm saying? So mm -hmm. I think that he had that vision like, yo, if I could put this together, it's going to be huge. Right. Because mm -hmm. when you when you like me, all you could see is music day and night. You just moving around like you all about the art and all about the culture. But I think that the misconception with prize is that when they look at it. it so, for example, if someone says if prize wasn't around would they have been a Fuji's? Mm -hmm. And the answer to that is no. Right. Because he sort of like came in at a time when he was strategically knew how to move the band. Um, sort of like, remember like Dame Dash? Yeah. Like Prize had that mentality on how to move the band and certain things we couldn't see because he was focused on, on business. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's why I would describe it. He definitely had a love for the idea of music. But I think that, I mean, he even says it himself. Like, mm -hmm. you know, he was more focused on um, the business side of it, right? Because when you lo really look at it and you look at the entire score and you, you, you listen to the parts and all of that, you could be like, for me, I always tell people I was the Haitian Dr. Dre. Mm -hmm. Like, it was like at the end of the day, I was the schemer. Like I could be like, okay, you're gonna do eight bars. Forte, you gonna come in here and kick you? You doing forty eight bars? Like you <laughs> right. don't stop. One of my favorite rappers, you know. But right. at the end of the right. day, similar to the RZA, right? Mm -hmm. I just yeah. knew how to put it together. But I, I think Prize strategically was definitely more about business than anything else. Mm. Now you mentioned Miss Hill already. We know you're not about gossip, and we don't, never want you to gossip on Miss Hill, but. When she was coming off the miseducation of Lauren Hill and was suddenly one of the most famous humans on earth, did you feel empathy for what she was going through? Yes. Once once again, as a, a 50 year old man, right? Do let me tell you, like there's things you go back to your twenties and you'd be like, yo, if I could really do that, I would do it different. You feel me? Mm -hmm. And it's like at the end of the day, my daughter's 15. You see what I'm saying? It's mm -hmm. like you, you, you have like a different, I have a different mindset. And they always say, well, if you could go back to your 20 year old self, what would you tell them? Right. So mm -hmm. if I could go back to my 20 year old self, I would say deeper than not just don't mix business with pleasure, but do not fuck with people's hearts. At the mm -hmm. end of the day, um, it's so important to understand that as humans, you know, we do bleed. So it's like, if I could ever say anything, what I would probably say to my 20 year old self is like, fully understand that. You know what I mean? Like, you're not a player, like you're a player mm -hmm. for now. But the reality is you, you playing around is going to cause someone's heart to bleed. You know what I mean? So mm -hmm. for sure. Have you ever heard the record I did called Miss Hill? Of course. <laughs> What's your One thoughts of my on favorite that? joints. Uh, uh, I love Miss Hill. One, you know, for me, as someone who understands the art of emceeing and how you approach the record and came to it, um, there's a few records that it reminded me of. One was Big Brother by Kanye. Yeah. Um, and just the idea of like how you, you know, you approached it 
um, in the angle of that level. I definitely love the record. Um, you were inspired by an artist named Bigger Haitian. Is that correct? Yeah, I love Bigger Haitian. <laughs> and other reggae artists, um, you developed a sort of dub plate approach to songwriting and matched it with a sound clash approach to stagecraft. When I listen to Wyclef Records, the first thing that strikes me is you're telling a story and you're narrating a story. Like you narrate, you narrate the record, right? You tell us exactly what's going on. You're like, this one's for the club. Here comes Shakira. Here comes Farrell March. I think the best example of it is going to November, where you're literally like, mm. your girl is sitting there, you're out hustling. Here's Wyclef voice in her ear. I feel like that comes from sort of the dub plate reggae style of making music. Is that accurate? Yeah, 100%. So the, the idea of dub plate is similar to hip hop. Um, my cousin, Jerry Wonder. Mm -hmm. um, Shout out to Jerry. Yeah. So, so, so Jerry is like my big brother. You feel what I'm saying? And mm -hmm. so he noticed like my talent at a young age and mm -hmm. he would always give me information mm -hmm. and he knows like I'm going to come back with some crazy stuff. So he literally gave me a Stone Love Clash tape. Your shows are like Stone Love, brother. Yeah, he gave me a Stone yeah. Love Clash tape at 15. And I was someone who used to like watch cartoons a lot and used to love like imitating cartoon voices and also like the Muppet show. So, you know, Kermit the Frog used to talk like this. I used to imitate <laughs> Kermit and all that. But in right. these sound tapes... The guys sounded like these like weird cartoon characters. So it was like inside of the dance we move. Welcome to our mm. stone love. Jump, young <laughs> big up on Zon. And I was like, yo, this sounds like courageous cat, right? It's yeah. like, this sounds like yeah. courageous cat. And I was like, right. yo, courageous so, cat and Minnie Mouse. You that's all. Yeah, Minnie Mouse. <laughs> so I, I felt I I felt that the most important part, which got me into the guys was like, I was like, they set up the narrative and it's like telling a kid a bedtime story. So it's almost like what I loved about the record, even if you didn't know what the record was, the way that they set it up, you knew what the record was about. So I yes. fell in love yeah. with that. So that is one of um, the Wyclef secret sources. So if yes. you watch my show from how I do my music, how I approach it, I always approach it from a, how am I going to tell the story before the record even dropped, you know? Yeah. Um, I changed the way that I did my show after uh, doing a couple of shows with you. I saw <laughs> you I saw you on Beast's shoulders, you know, uh -huh. running through the crowd. Shout out to Beast. Yeah. I, sh I saw you, you know, I saw you jumping up and down. I was like, this is like listening to a Stone Love tape. And you know what it made me feel like? It made me feel like, I'm like, God damn, I'm rapping too goddamn much. I'm like, I'm, I'm, I'm <laughs> trying to spit all these, all these verses, trying to do the whole song. Wyclef is yeah. in and out. He in and out. He doing dub versions of of, of yeah. current hits, all that. Yeah. So I appreciate. Um, did you did you watch the Beanie Man and Bounty versus? Yeah, definitely. <laughs> Beanie Bounty, my brothers. You know. Yeah, what they I mean? both. I I thought it was interesting that when they both referenced their hip hop records, they referenced records that they did with you. Yeah, those are my brothers. You know, I love them to death. And then you know, so for us, um, versus to to us, like when we're watching it. It's called Sound Clash. You know a what sound I mean? Sound Clash. That's right. It's a Sound Clash. So I would say like till today, um, the best verses happen to be Bounty and Beanie. That's but right. I'm saying right. that because the reason why that's the best is because that culture is what they naturally do. Like yes. since they come yes. out, they mama birth, like they verses, they constantly, that's why you could see the format. They go against each other. Then they start freestyling eight bars for eight bars. Yes, then they yes. go. So for me, um, shout out to, to, to Swiss Timberland, the, the entire platform. But once again, it gave the, a chance for people that didn't know the Caribbean to, to understand it, you know? Yeah, man, that was a party. I had to stretch before that versus so I oh can be ready God. and I only almost delivered my baby early. But anywho, <laughs> uh, <laughs> have you been approached to do versus uh, who do you think would be the right person for you to go against? Maybe Diddy? No, I, I, I mean, I was approached definitely. And it's so funny. I have a freestyle. Um, that I said, like, you know, that I did. And then they took the freestyle and they put it on versus. Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, I think, um, 
for me, the, the mo, the person who resembles me the most, like in the background with the studio that I fully know that they do is probably like Will I Am for oh, multiple yeah. reasons. Like when I, I tell you multiple, shit. when I tell you multiple reasons, like my manager was David Sonnenberg and Jimmy Iovine was obsessed with like, how is he going to get a new Fuji? And then once <laughs> we left David Sonnenberg, Will I Am became the new Y Clef for him. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, you? yeah. Will is like a little brother. What I could say, and people don't know, like, I produced one of the first Black Eyed Peas records before Fergie oh, wow, got in the wow. band. The reason why I say Will is because Will strategically was like that nerd like me, the guy who, you know, he's the guy behind the schemes, you know? So for me, um, he's incredible because for me, it's more, it's not about um, hit songs or whatever. It's more like the mechanicals, the little things that people don't see. I think they'd probably mm -hmm. be shocked with um the the amount of information so i you know people was like yo why clef versus akon would be dope um i love akon akon is incredible i i put akon on his first record the world mm -hmm. has ever heard the fuji la remix but i think that with me and akon we just be singing songs where <laughs> will i am he literally show up with an entire futuristic deck and i would do the same and you would literally see how the records are broken down and done so that'd be dope yeah I'd love to see that list. You heard it first here. I, I, yeah. Will I Am has produced two of my favorite records of my career. Uh, Say Something with featuring Gene Gray yeah. and, and Hot Thing, which is a big record for yeah, me. Genius, just like you. Genius, just like you. kid. He's genius. Yeah, he's, he's super it. genius. Now, when I was in sixth grade, I had a, I had a Spanish teacher named Dorothy Isom, Miss Isom from Panama. And the way that she taught us Spanish, and some of the Spanish I learned in her sixth grade sp Spanish class, I still retain. But the way that she taught it to us was through music. And the first song mm. she taught us was La Bamba. And this was 1987. And then that movie came out with about Richie Valens, about his journey. And I knew all the words to La Bamba. The next song she taught us was Guantanamera. And so I've always known all the words to Guantanamera since I was in sixth grade. Yo soy hombre yo soy sincero. Hombre. And so when you dropped that, <laughs> I was like, yo, Miss Isom was right. Now, <laughs> talk to me about you made Guantanamera over. You did The Gambler over, rest in peace to Kenny Rogers. You just staying alive over. I just recently heard a version of a, of a You Doing Queen, uh, Another One Bites the Dust, and it's crazy because I'm listening to the record, and I'm like, yo, how did Wyclef record with Freddie Mercury? Freddie Mercury was, was dead and gone by the time this came out. And then right as I said it, you said in the lyrics, this is the master reel. You know what I'm saying? To let me know. <laughs> let me know. The so, dub plate so, strikes again, right? <laughs> yes, it strikes again. So out of all those sort of hip hop reimaginings, which one is your favorite that you've done? Well, I think for me, it was more like, I was listening to radio mm -hmm. and I was like, how come there's like no Spanish music on black radio? Mm -hmm. Like I was like, mm -hmm. every hip hop things we hearing, like how come there's like, I'm hearing my favorite Spanish rappers, they are killing it. But mm -hmm. I felt like they was separating it. They was putting the reggaeton in one place, and then it was put in us in one place. Mm -hmm. And it was like, but I felt like it was all one thing. Like we all had the same, whether if Tego was speaking his message or we were speaking our message, it was the same. So I reached out to Celia Cruz mm -hmm. and- The goddess. It went, yeah, when I got Celia in the studio, you know, it was like, you already know that's like goddess to the T. Mm -hmm. And I was like, we're going to remake this. I love Guantanamera because it's a revolutionary poem. And the idea for me was like, if we can pop the right frequency on this, um, me and Jerry Wonder, that it would like play on like hip hop radio. So Guantanamera literally is like the first explosion of Spanish hip hop on that radio. So for me, um, I was like coming from Haiti, having family from Cuba, Santo Domingo. That was important to me. Um, another record, The Gambler. So I was obsessed with Farrell March. Like when I tell you obsessed, cause I love rappers. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, and, uh, I called Kenny Rogers, uh, you know, God bless the dead. And I told Kenny Rogers, there's this rapper called Farrell March. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I have an idea because everybody in the hood knows like 
you got to know when to hold them, know when that's to right. fold them, know when to walk. I said, that's the biggest gun song in the world. And I was like, I would like to take for you to do a dub play for me. And then I'm going to mash it with Farrell Marsh. Long before Old Town Road and all of that, we had the country music and blending in with the hip hop. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So my, my thing has always been like Quincy would say, global gumbo. I always believed in the idea of fusion because we are fusion. And for me, like people on this hip hop's a pillar. And even like you could hear Afro beats. Mm -hmm. Everything you hear, there's a part of hip hop and it. it's the pillar. So that's how I just literally was like, how can I unify the world through music? And I hate being put in a box. I mean, mm -hmm. the idea of a man or a woman saying, don't play rock guitar, like stay in your lane, you know, don't, mm. you know, no, I grew up listening to Nirvana, Run DMC, country music, hip hop. To me, it's all fusion, you know? Uh, you met Destiny's Child early on in their career and you famously say that you knew like a lightning bolt that they were going to be huge stars. Uh, what is it that Went you from a dream to the young Supreme. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Thank you for, thank you. For, anyway. All right, sorry, <laughs> sidetrack. Uh, what was it that you saw in them and what do you feel like that Beyonce took from your career um, on her journey to become one of the most famous musicians of the century? Well, I mean, definitely, I would say, um, if Beyonce is watching this, congratulations. She, is, she loves us. Of course. <laughs> but now, there's a few things, right, that I remember. One is the approach. Um, Stephanie Gell said, there's these girls we need you to work with. Um, when I met them, I said, sing a church song for me. And Beyonce had the lead they sang, the church song. When I went over to do the record, at the time, now here goes my, my producer's brain again. Mm -hmm. So I was like, in Texas, they rapping like old DOS effects. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like everything was going double time and triple time. And then I was like, well, the only person we really gave this rap sing formula to so far was Lauren. So Lauren was the only one that was pulling it off on a high level, like rhyming and singing. And then I was like, okay, but this is not a rhyming group. It's a singing group. But what happens if I take that formula, because they're from Texas, and take the lyrics and make it go double time. They've never heard girls do that before. So literally, mm -hmm. the girls was like, pa pa da pa da pa 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 da pa da pa da 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 da. So I took what would be a slow R and B song, and then I put it in a double timing. Now I gave them that format, which was like rhyme singing, right? And uh, and I would say for me, um, that definitely was a pillar, it created a new thing. You know what I'm saying? And and our job is just, if you like, you plug up an electron. So we're not mm -hmm. here to talk about what could have, should have. You know, it's like LeBron's old coach saying, oh, LeBron wouldn't have been me if it was. No, the person is already them. So it's like, when I saw them, um, I just felt like all of them was beyond talented, but I just mm -hmm. felt like, Beyonce and Kelly to me just felt like chosen for other things. Mm. Man, so you, your career path has led you to working with some of the biggest stars in the world. I can't see Shakira, a picture or a video without hearing your voice saying her name. Um, Hips Don't Lie <laughs> is the highest selling song of the 21st century. It has 800 million YouTube views. Now that song was originally your song featuring Claudette Ortiz Right, dance like this, and I also heard that it maybe even was originally a Fuji song. Is that true? Well, there's a lot of stuff that I wanted to do with the Fujis that I couldn't do mm -hmm. that I ended up doing on a carnival, right? Okay, because like you know, I'm like a coconut man. Like I, <laughs> I, I love making people dance. Like that's one of my favorite things. Clive Davis, who's one of my godfathers, mm -hmm. he he was doing. Uh, soundtrack for Havana Nights, and he hit me up. Right. And at that's the Dirty time, Dancing too for people who are watching. And, and if Claudette Artiz is watching this, I was like, I always push Claudette to sing in Spanish. 
Like, I'm like, yo, you see, if you mix the Spanish with the, it's going to be, you know, and at the time we have the group City High. City High, right. The oh, original, no. the original version is called Dance Like This. You can go and you'll hear a version with Claudette singing and killing it soulfully with her staff. Mm. And I think like two years later, Charlie Walk approached me and said that they were looking for a record for Shakira, right? And the good thing about us being like hip hop kids, right? But let me back up mm. once again. There was a lot of backlash on my end from the hip hop community when they first heard this record. Let me go back because they didn't think I, they didn't know where I was coming from. I'm a weirdo. Mm. So when they heard, bah, 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 nah, 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 they was like, yo, man, that's Lord Tariq and Peter Guns, man. Mm. Like he didn't. And I'm a huge fan of Lord Tariq and Peter Guns, but that sample is way before that. That's way before. Yeah. They sampled that record. That's right. But you know, you know, like my background with Latin music, we talked about that. So mm -hmm. for me, when Shaki got on the record, what made it different, right? As a producer, we can write, but it's like a movie, a Quentin Tarantino movie. Mm -hmm. Depending on who the cast is, it can go like this to just explode it. And I promise you not, when Shakira said Hips Don't Lie and the video came out, it just <clears throat> made the record believable. You know what I oh, mean? Yeah. It made oh, the yeah. idea of like, you was like, yeah, this person's hips really don't lie. The way they move Those hips hand, are telling the truth. You know? I would and, um, be belly dancing. <laughs> and then I love the energy. And I would say Shakira brought an energy in the studio. And we went back, reworked wor the record with a lot of sounds coming out of Colombia. You know what mm -hmm. I'm saying? And then when I say, you know, it's the Haitians and Colombians, you know? Um, I think... That sort of like what spawned that record, the combination. Sometimes you can write a great record, but if the cast ain't heavy, mm -hmm. 10 years later, another group can come and do it and still blow it up. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Um, that goes back to that dub plate thing as well. Um, mm -hmm. We both in Dave Chappelle's block party, which famously yes. brought the Fugees back together on stage for the first time in a long time. Dave Chappelle is a huge fan of yours. I'm, um, actually out here in Yellow Springs in Dave Chappelle's town and we're doing shows every weekend. He asked me to invite you out. Um, but the other night I was hanging out with Dave and we were, we were plotting and planning the scheming and he played My Love Is Your Love that you produced mm. for Whitney Houston on repeat for about an hour and a half. Y'all see me? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Are you about to play it? Oh my gosh. Y'all see it? Yeah, yeah. All right. So here we go. So... My Love's Your Love, mm -hmm. I got approached by Whitney. Mm -hmm. um, Clive said, yo, do you want do you want to do a song for Whitney? And I was like, Whitney Houston? Come on, man. <laughs> Tears came out of my eyes. He right. was like, yeah, I need the song in 24 hours. Mm. Wow. So I went, and this is what we talk about, the preacher's son, the, mm -hmm. pre, the PK in me. So literally, I knew Whitney's background. <clears throat> and I was like, the only thing that people's going to believe is the truth. So I didn't really know how she was going to feel about this. You know what I mean? So <clears throat> automatically, the first thing that came to my head was the call of response, right? In mm -hmm. the church, right? So so automatically, the first chords that came, I was like, oh. Clap your hands, y'all. It's all right. Clap your hands, y'all. It's all right. Because I was like, okay, the call of response. And mm -hmm. now the second part of the song that came to me was like, what is the first line I could say? Because Whitney hadn't done a studio record in so long and so many rumors, right, was going on and how he was going to yeah. approach it. And, you know, one of the bands I thought about was the Winings, which was a great gospel band. So that's why when you hear the chords and you see they're very pretty, I'm like... So right. the most touching thing about that record, and sometimes when you do record, people hear it and they don't understand it's a frequency. Mm -hmm. The record, when I'm in the studio <clears throat> with Jerry, 
I see Whitley's relationship with her daughter. <clears throat> Let me see. And okay. you made me go to the piano. <laughs> so Yeah, yeah. I'm glad it was there. Yeah. I see I see Whitney's relationship with her daughter. And it's the most beautiful thing. And I put the microphone, I take the mic and I put it in front of her daughter and I say, what you just told your mom? And she was like, sing, mommy. Now, Whitney don't know what I'm going to do with it. You know what I'm saying? Right. She's like, I take it dub play style and I hold on to it. And <clears throat> Whitney goes and she sings. Now, keep in mind, I'm in with the whole family. Mm-hmm. Now, here's a few secrets on that on, on this record. I have Bobby Brown also doing background. Okay. Mm. I just never told nobody. Right. Right? So for me, what was amazing and when people was like, yo, you going to the studio, are you sure you're going to be able to control the session? It's going to be the whole... Fam, this record in the course of history, so like when Dave keeps playing it back, right, there's something called energy because we just hear the records. Like, why do we keep playing Bob Marley and over again? There'd be yeah. this whole other energy that be channeling that. So for me, seeing Whitney in that space and watching how she loved her family for me uh, was the most incredible thing when when I mm. saw that record come to life. Mm. It's beautiful, brother. Beautiful. Um, also, speaking of Dave, on Block Party, you sang If I, were, I Was President to them kids. And I've seen you on the road before the Block Party sort of develop that song and sing it with your guitar. It was so powerful, so sincere. Um, then, as you've mentioned, years later, you ran for president of Haiti. Would you ever do it again? And how has your experience been going from calling for social change to trying to be a person who actually enacts it to running for office? Well, I think for me, besides losing my father, mm-hmm. that was probably one of the hardest things. Mm-hmm. You know, in my country at times, I was called the gang leader. Mm-hmm. They did. They said, you know, it's called drug dealer, all kind of stuff. They didn't understand how I could control the coastline mm. and control all the gangs on the ground. Mm-hmm. And I think till today, they still trying to figure that out. Mm. Well, I come from them. I'm a child of the soil. Mm-hmm. And I think if I learned anything about politics mm-hmm. was they felt like I was a populist. Mm. Like at the end of the day, the movement that we had was so strong before I even got in. Mm. They infiltrated and used mm. every form of power to get me out. And at the end of the day, would I ever run for president again? I ran for president because I felt like we didn't have a leader at the time. My job is to work with government. I'm a private sector guy. I believe in job creation. That's what I would love to do in my country. Bring mm. 40,000 jobs, bring 50,000 jobs build educate you know a, a education structure build schools right mm-hmm. but i tell you this whenever i feel like there's a void i'm going to always step up because at the end of the day if my leader Toussaint Louverture died in a dungeon mm-hmm. trying to make things better for us i can't just sit back and watch my people fall and i don't help so right. i'm a constantly like represent. I mean, you you guys see me on Oprah, tears in my eyes. Like they made memes of me. Like, mm-hmm. you know, you do you know, like what it takes to make a man cry. Like, I'm telling you, like, I'm I'm surrounded, twenty five thousand kids ready to move. I'm yeah. telling yeah. you, more guns than the military, and they say, yo. Why'd you, why the tear? And I said, the tear came from, if you seen what I saw, if you seen a mother with a baby in her stomach, just dead on the ground, Mm. pregnant, dead on the ground. If you saw a young kid ready to die and he seeing you, and right on the floor, he calls your name. And now I got to walk over to him. This is different than we on the block, dude, pull up. We know what's going to happen. 
This is a different kind of death. He goes, Clef, you know I love you. You're my hero. Mm. And I say, I love you too. And he says, how do I look? And I know he's about to go. So now, which some of us have had this experience, it's no joke when you got to trans, when you got to be the transport of having someone leave to go to the other side. It's no joke. Mm. And he says to me, can you sing me a song? Mm. Mm. Sing me Yele. Mm. And I start to sing Yele, Yele, Yele. And he's, I feel him leave. I said, if you too seen that, you would shed a tear too. Because the greatest thing we have as human beings is when we could realize that we are in the likeness of God and in G-O-D. And then so for God to show me that within his presence, for me, um, it let me know my role. It let you know your role. It let all of us know our roles. You know what I mean? Mm. Yes, I do. Thank you for sharing yeah. that. Uh, Yele had Haiti didn't go as planned. Uh, it was messy and you had a lot of fallout from it that you had to deal with. Um, what lessons did you learn from fundraising on that level and that scale? And what advice would you give to community organizers dealing with big dollar amounts during this current time? Well, the first thing I'd like to say is um, whether we're talking about fundraisers for Haiti, we talk about New Orleans, and we could go in different places. The first thing I want y'all to look at is a, a structure of billions of dollars, right? So let's back up. So they said that Wyclef Jean stole $16 million from his own foundation, right? So yeah. now let's back up by how much money was given to Haiti. So the first, the first part of the structure is, I love you, my daughter. The first part of the structure is billions of dollars went to the Red Cross. Where's all that money? Mm -hmm. The second part of the structure is there was all kinds of funds that was set up. Like, so my boy Bill Clinton had a fund with George Bush. That was one mm -hmm. fund. We can go with continuous. I could keep telling you all these funds, right? Mm -hmm. Not one conversation about this all the way up till today. Where's all these billions, right? So what I want people to know is a black man in America with all of the intel that they have, with all of the energy that they have to trace the money, there is no way in hell you're going to steal $16 million and they are not going to come and get you from your house, put mm -hmm. cuffs on your hands and walk you away and make a complete example out of you. Mm -hmm. Now, what I want y'all to notice is the minute I went back into music and I went back into my world and I stopped talking about politics in one way, you don't hear nothing no more, do you? That's right. So is this your way of putting a nigga in his place, right? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. what I want y'all to understand is, first of all, Marcus Garvey, infiltration happened. That's right. Black Panther, infiltration happened. Martin Luther King, I seen him marching, they were spitting on his face. Mm -hmm. Preachers even said he was using the end AACP to fund his own thing. Then mm -hmm. later, they changed their minds. Mm -hmm. What I want y'all to know today on the show is when they said I did this, I wrote a complete article to show where all of the money went mm -hmm. and send it to all of the papers. How come not one? printed it. That's not the story. <laughs> right? How come That's not one that, printed yeah. it? Right? So, mm -hmm. so, so what I want y'all to understand is it made me stronger and I'm not going to be a nigga that's going to stay in its place. Mm -hmm. And what it does is in the fire, 
when you go through the sacrifice, you learn and you understand how to move forward. So what I want y'all to do is in moving forward, just be more uh, vigilant, like be more diligent. When they say so-and-so did something, always look at the backstory. So as we move forward now, we are constantly giving kids scholarships in schools. We do not plan on stopping to help Haiti. We're focused on how we could bring job creations back to our country. And, um, And like I said, for me to be on my two feet and my two hands, and have survived this wrath, it was no joke. Yeah, you're right. I mean, I I um fundraised for Ferguson, and I raised a hundred thousand dollars, and I knew I you know I saw what you was going through, and I was like, no, nope, they're not gonna do me like Wycliffe. They they trying to do that brother dirty. Like I'm gonna make sure yeah. that. And even with me crossing all my uh, T's and dying on my eyes and being upfront and transparent, I was still accused of stealing that money. Yeah, but to your point. So let me tell you something. Mm -hmm. Red Cross. Mm -hmm. Do you know how they look? Do you know their face? Mm -hmm. Do we know who they are? Mm -hmm. No, we don't. No, we do not. Who is it? Who is it? So who do you have to excuse? With us, it's different because literally artists and celebrities put their face. It's like Mm -hmm. they tie a face to it. And this is what they use to do what they do to us. You know? Yeah, you're right. Um, Now, you've been relevant as a musician even through that whole thing, as you said, you were you're so relevant. You were able to go try to do that and then come back. Yeah, um, it's cra- it was crazy. It yeah. was crazy though. <laughs> yeah, so you came back to the music world, but while that was happening, your impact was still felt. Tell me about how you felt. I know you have a good relationship with DJ Khaled. But how did you feel when you first heard the Santana cover of Maria Maria Wild Thoughts with with uh, with Tori and and Rihanna? And also, where's product GMB? Great question, man. So. <laughs> I would say like when I came back from Haiti and saw everything that they was doing, the first thing I did was I went to Sweden mm-hmm. with my little brother, Avicii. Oh man, that was and my I next used, question. Yeah, and I call Avicii the, the Viking gang. You know, like mm-hmm. we used to always say Viking mafia, Haitian mafia. And I went because I went to find myself again. And what I mean by that is as musicians, as poets, as authors, there's got, it comes a time where, dude, I really thought I was going to be the president. It mm-hmm. didn't happen. I'm like, what, what am I going to do? Like, come back. I had no purpose in singing no more songs. Like, it makes right. no sense what right. I'm going to do. There was no so, plan B at the time, right? No plan B. So right. I go to Sweden because I heard this Wake Me Up song. And, Great song. And, and I love the energy. Spend time with the Vici. And we ended up making an entire album that I don't know when it's going to come out, but it was called like Winter in Stockholm. Mm -hmm. In this process, though, we wrote a song that scored the World Cup anthem again. So not only did I write one World Cup anthem with Shakira, and it's hard to write World Cup anthems. It's billions of people. So my first comeback was outside of America. I wrote the big anthem that ended up being performed in Brazil. Me, I brought Carlos Santana back. So that sort of like helped me understand that, okay, you have a chapter two going on, right? Mm -hmm. So for me, when I came back to the States, uh, one of the first records I did, which is funny, if people now they go back on the streaming platforms, it's over 500 million streams on all the platforms, was it was called Hendrix. And I was like, well, I'm going to do a song and I'm going to explain to a 20 year old who I am. When my cousin got his first tech, right? And I was like, that's a great song too. It's nothing new to me to mix sonics, right? Because Mm -hmm. whether if it's acoustic, it's trap, the world that we from is all called music. So Mm -hmm. if you know why Clef, you already know. So Leo Cohen's was like, yo, Young Thug is looking for you. You know, there's this artist, he loves you. He wants to get with you. And then, so Quincy Jones always told me that, that one of the things I learned from Quincy and from Michael Jackson, the real, inv- the, the, the reinvention of yourself really won't come from you. It'll constantly come from the youth. And mm-hmm. what that means is if we like a book, we pass it on to the next generation. They like it on, they keep passing it. So I would say like between like with Thugger, that this whole energy, it, 
the kids just automatically thought I was some new artist, like Young Thug's uncle. Mm -hmm. Right. So, because he, for context, he has a record called Wyclef Jean, and y'all have a record called Kanye West, which I got to be honest, I don't know what y'all talk about on that Kanye West record. <laughs> so, what what's funny about that, right, <clears throat> is we think different. Mm -hmm. So it's a young kid, and he goes, well. Con and I could speak in behalf of Thugger, right? So mm -hmm. his whole thing was like, these are the people that inspired me mm -hmm. to be Young Thug. So when, when I go in the studio with him, he plays me a bunch of acoustic records. He's like, Clef, mm -hmm. this is how you inspire me. Kanye inspired him. Elton John inspired him. So everyone he named on these records, it wasn't like the records was about them. It was his right. way of, of coding to his generation uh, these are the people that y'all should probably listen to because they inspired me. So mm -hmm. within that process, it was his birthday. We had an incredible time. And I said something that made the internet go crazy when I was making the comparison with the Thugger and the Tupac thing. Right. Mm. They went crazy, right? Once again, misinformation, right? Because when someone writes something, they write it so they can switch bait at audience. They don't even say the whole thing. So they go, yo, Clef is comparing to... No. What I was saying was my short time in the studio with Young Thug, his knowledge about Haiti, his baby's... His kid is named Haiti. They okay. projects named Haiti. He like, man, I wish I was born Haitian, man. <laughs> His, his <laughs> intellect of the Haitian revolution, understanding mm -hmm. the Zos, mm -hmm. reminded me of like when I was in a green room with Pac and we was just talking Black Panther stuff. Mm. So for me, at the end of the day, when Khaled calls me up and me and Khaled go way back and he's like, yo, I got an idea, man. You know, I'm going to, you know, Khaled does the big movie and he's like, I've been sitting on this one. I'm, you know, uh, I need you to call Santana, you know, and... I get Khaled on the phone with Santana, you know, they become super buddies right. and everything dope. I would say for me, the best thing about that record was that it just shows you again, like that record, if you speak to Santana, the first thing that came out of that record, right? The first thing was just this. So it's so crazy to me, like when I wrote that Bossa Nova riff is just once again, going back to the jazz roots. And yeah. then so when they sample, when, when Khaled did that over, um, I always say it just made me cool again to my daughter who's 15 yeah. years old. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Word up. First of all, I'm so happy you have that piano back there. You're giving me so much life right now. Thank Yo, and it's so you. crazy because we was trying to find a place for light. I was in one side of the house that right. wasn't working right. and came and happened to have it a piano. It was meant to be. It was it's meant divine. to be. You've called Quincy Jones your godfather in secret. What's your relationship like and how has using his career as a blueprint helped you find and carve your own path? And tell us about the first time you've met him. Well... Uh, there's a prestigious festival in Montrose. It's called, you know, it's the Jazz Festival. The Montrose Jazz Festival. Yeah, good one. You'll see Miles, you'll see Nina, you see everyone. This, this I actually performed at the Montrose Jazz Festival for Quincy Jones' birthday party with Robert Glasper and Yasin Bey a couple of years ago. Years ago. Yeah, mm. okay, you know the vibe, yeah. yeah. So that's like Q's playground. You know yeah, yeah, that's a spot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's cute playground. So um, Quincy brought me to the festival and introduced me. And, you know, that's what he said about me and the conversations we had. It's like I idolize this guy. I look up to him. And mm -hmm. what I loved about the festival, I came out. And if anyone check it out online for that one, when Q brought me out, I started off on piano, like literally mm -hmm. people usually see me on guitar. You know, I was like, Montrose, we're going to start off with some jazz vibes. And I would say my relationship with Quincy Jones is dope. Maybe I talked to Quincy Jones 30 times in my entire life. Mm -hmm. Every time 
it's like we have the craziest relationship. One time, we doing something like for a charity, and it's a giant stadium. The stadium is half filled. It's me, Quincy Jones, and Bonner. And we're making jokes about how come all three of us is here and the stadium ain't double filled, but they didn't mm-hmm. promote it. You know what I'm saying? So yeah. we have like these talks and I've been to Quincy's house. And I would say for me, what I learned about Quincy Jones is he reminds me of who I am. Mm. Cause sometimes you could forget who you are because you living in your own body and you're mm-hmm. trying to get out of your element and do something else. So you're not the guy who's just supposed to worry about doing a song or an album or when is it going to be charted. You're the guy who literally you're created to constantly be putting out music and scoring films and finding artists and mm-hmm. what are you going to do next? So I would say for me, that's like the greatest thing about Q is like he reminds me of how important I am mm-hmm. while I'm alive, you know? Word up, word up. Yeah, Q, man, I'm I'm on his one, his, one of his albums, that Soul Boss, Bossa Nostra album. I'm on the first song uh-huh. that we did Iron, Iron Side over. Um, now, you are also acting in the most gangster Jamaican flick ever, Shatas. I've overheard you say that people keep asking you when <laughs> the Fuji's going to get back and when Shatas 2 is coming out. Now, <laughs> Shatas is some gangster shit. Um, you talked about your relationship with Young Thug. Young Thug talks a lot of gangster shit. Um, I see you as sort of gangster adjacent. You speak about being zoned up. You run around with some of the most notorious, quote unquote, gangsters out of Haiti. How do you balance being a pop star, someone who ran for president, and also r- running with those c- type of people and as an artist telling their stories? Well, I think... Um the Fed, the, the 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 Feds in America, they call me HS. <laughs> What's that mean? Haitian Sinatra. Okay. <laughs> so literally, they have a wall. You know what I'm saying? Like, right. And don't Haitian think, Sicilians. Like, you said hey, the Haitian Sicilians on the record back in the day. Yeah, you, and you heard it like from the beginning, like mm-hmm. these words. So I would say, like, the thing that. People don't understand the refugee camp, the actual mm-hmm. John Forte, Wyclef, the, mm-hmm. the crew is really, it's really a real crew. And at the end of the day, we're no different, man. Like we're no different. If I, if I am the, to be on your show right now mm-hmm. and to tell you that I wasn't one of them kids with a hoodie that could pull up on you. Like, you know what I mean? And then have you feel something and be like, yo, boy, I run your shoes. And then the minute police show up, you're like, yo, it's a Jamaican. Not knowing it was a kid with a Haitian accent. I'd be lying Mm -hmm. to you. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, I always say my mom took a gun out of my hand and she gave me a guitar. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is, and I don't have to say it like they'll speak for me, right? So... It's so funny because, you know, and I, I, I definitely will, 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 will say this to you. So there's something that's going to come out and the whole world is going to, they're going to hear Haitian Jack said that his cousin is Wyclef. Mm-hmm. Right? Mm-hmm. And people be like, yo, but like we 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 don't get it like you saying like you saying yo you really move with but at the end of the day there's no difference with any of us like mm-hmm. we literally came to america and our parents was trying to do the best with us some mm-hmm. of us end up in this situation that situation but where we all connect that is that flag. At the end of the day, we all know our history and we all wanted a better future for the new kids that was up on the rise. So Mm -hmm. that's really where it's at. And and I noticed something that the time of the Fugees, 
a lot of people was getting extorted. Like they was taking money from people. Mm-hmm. They was taking jewelry from people. They were hanging people from balconies, mm. right? And keep in mind, we're 20 million strong, right? And yeah. in this time, yeah. right? They'll tell you, Clef pulls up in the Bronx with his F1 McLaren, gets out, leave it in the hood, goes walk, right? Mm. And because I can't take it with me nowhere. And I remember Suge Knight. Mm. Suge Knight comes to my birthday party in Miami one time. And every Sony exec that was with me, by the time I turned around, they all had jumped. They was gone. <laughs> and he gets on the mic and he goes, yo, I just want to, I just want to say what's up to the realest nigga that I know, man. Why Clef John? This is one of the real. And everyone's looking and they're like, what is his relationship with Suge Knight? He never mm-hmm. talks about, right? Because at the end of the day, I ain't impressed with no gangster. Mm-hmm. I'm not impressed. Like, because that's just the word that a quotation that you use. That's right. We men right. and men discuss conversations as men, right? I don't fear death. It's mm-hmm. coming regardless. So at the end of the day, I think that the level of respect and the maturity that has got us this far is I encourage all of the young youth to be a leader mm-hmm. of your circle, right? And a leader means you take responsibility. And if God has put us in a position where your guns have to stay at your house for protection, right? If you're in a car, you have enough money to make sure that you have licenses as you move around and to make sure that there's enough people around you and you have to operate as a leader. Once mm-hmm. God puts you in that position, you have to operate as a leader. So that's what I always encourage people. No doubt. No doubt. Now, I was going to use this opportunity to try to get a record with you because you and me have floated in each other's circle for a <laughs> year, but we never did a record. But then I remembered that we actually are on a song together. Um, do you know the song we on together? Which one? It's called It's called Kidney Now. It's from 30 Rock. Yeah. <laughs> but we got to do one together just to us. No doubt. No doubt. Do you have a desire to act? But well, I was going to let you play the guitar. Why don't you go ahead and, and play what you got on your mind over there? <laughs> I'm just tuning up for you, baby. Okay. This might be um, the record right I, here. <laughs> it might be here. Yes. It might be live. Um, do you have more of a desire to act at all? Um, no, I just act like as a hobby. It's just fun to me. Okay. You know what I'm saying? Okay. Like I respect like Will Smith. I respect Jamie Foxx because the, the obligations that it takes to act is no joke. Like you got to be ready true. for it. That's true. Speaking of acting, this isn't on the script, but on our questions, but I love Carmen Hip Hop Dra. It's one of my favorite <laughs> movies. So shout out to you for that. Uh, uh, in, <laughs> in 2009, you enrolled in Berkeley College of Music. How has that helped you grow as a musician? And would you suggest that it's something that every musician would, should do? Well, uh, I first went to Five Town College in Long Island and I actually Great. went back. They just gave me my doctor of music and I went to Berkeley because I always loved studying and mm. I left because I tried to become president of Haiti. Um, mm. <laughs> I think that as we move into the new generations, there's just faster way to get the education. I mm. really believe in the new structure. One thing that I, I, I stomachs me is how kids are constantly paying past school. So it's yeah. almost like you yeah. spend all of this time in school for, and then you have this big credit card bill that mm-hmm. literally you have to pay for the rest of your life. So yeah. I definitely encourage my daughter with school and everything. I love learning. But at the same time, we have to get better policies and legislation so that the youth are not constantly paying for everything, you know? Yeah, I agree. Debt cancellation, student debt cancellation is something that I definitely support. Um, Please. Thank you for making a carnival in 1997. Uh, Carnival 2 came out in 2007, Carnival 3, 2017. So are we getting Carnival 4 in 2027, every 10 years on the sevens? Man, I don't even know. But I would tell you what I'm most excited about Mm -hmm. is the future of the youth. So Carnival, my company Carnival, um, raised uh, we raised $25 million for my Mm -hmm. company. It was in the Forbes for my new publishing company. And what I'm excited about is signing the future 
of what's coming out of Africa. The okay. future of okay. what's coming out of the Caribbean and the rural areas throughout America. And you were a pi- you were pioneering that space with the Proud to Be African record, with the Afrobeat stuff that's going on. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So all of the kids to them, it's like I'm their uncle because long mm-hmm. before it's popular, we heavy in Africa. But yeah. I like the idea of not just making money, but the idea of what are you going to do about the future? Because mm-hmm. we good. You good. I'm good. We good at the end of the day. Our kids is going to be good. But the generation to come, if we don't set them up, then we fail. So that's That's the concentration. Mm -hmm. That's right. Well, Clef, you've given us so much of your time. I just got a couple more questions. And I thank you in advance for your time. Um, One of my favorite artists is Nina Simone. Me and Miss Hill share that. She I I consider um, Nina Simone my uh, my musical godmother. You covered a record recently that Nina Simone made famous, uh, Nikita Paz. What made you want to cover that record? Um, Nikita Paz is one of the songs that my mother used to sing to me at a very young age. The mm-hmm. original version was from Jacques Brel. And mm-hmm. it's like, don't ever leave me. And so it was one of them songs where my mama was sad in the kitchen. Um, I would make her smile. I, I would put on that. Nikita Paz. Like do my Nina Simone (laughs) impression, you know what I mean? So, um, of course, I'm obsessed with Nina Simone just like y'all, 100%. Speaking of that, Mm -hmm. I am going to send you an an artist. Okay. Her name is Hannah Iggins. Okay. By way of Bermuda. And that's all I'm going to say. Okay, I look forward. New Generation is not playing. The new air that I see coming out there when you're looking for the music, um, at times she reminds me of Nina. She's obsessed with Nina Simone, of course, Mm -hmm. and also with Billie Holiday. So I heard that Maxine from Perfect Gentleman is now a medical professional (laughs) in the cannabis industry. Is that correct? Oh, yeah, definitely. Like Once again, we go back to that soundboard thing. Everything Mm -hmm. that I write is real. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Maxine was a real last year of high school of uh, Velsberg High. We had the go-go joint right around the corner. You know what I'm saying? And I used to go clean up because I was a little younger. Uh-huh. And the conversation with Maxine, uh, it happened. It literally I was like, what you doing here? You feel me? And um, and Maxine today, yes, is a medical doctor. <laughs> Shout out to Maxine. Mm-hmm. Word is bond. Heavy. Um, now, you self-describe as an audio engineer, and you've recently been working on a new coding system for audio. Can you explain to people why the compressed MP3 is maybe not the best way for people to hear sound? And what's your vision for how we can listen to music in the future? Man, that's such a great question to all of my audio geeks that's out there, right? Mm-hmm. Um, I feel like... Shout out to my engineer in, in the back. He's, his ears perked up when he heard me ask this. Big shout out to all the engineers. I think we need more space. I think we need mm-hmm. more space in the sound. So Mm -hmm. the person who was very advanced was Michael Jackson. He Mm -hmm. had a record that never came out here where they did it through what's called binaural. So Mm -hmm. I want everybody to remember this word, binaural. So when you're listening to like Pink Floyd, The Wall, they're using like these binaurals. So Mm -hmm. DJ Khaled, when I did his headphones, I'm the one who who tuned the algorithm for DJ Khaled's headphones. Mm -hmm. When you talk to him, he'll tell you about that. So literally, um, I feel like the new form is like we need more spacious in the in the music. I used to like the old Sony headphones. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like basically, it used to give us a lot of room. When the files are compressed and they literally sent, I want everybody to understand. It's almost like it's like this. By the time it's compressed and it's sent, what's over to the other side is this is what you're getting. You know what I mean? A little mm-hmm. tiny bit. So I think that the same way that people are fighting for visual. It's the same way that I feel like we have to fight towards better audio. And I think Mm -hmm. that as the future move, as you see gamers are getting more into video games and the way like they're hearing things coming out of different sides of the room, I feel that the world is definitely going to be open to a new form of stereo as we move forward. No doubt. I'm excited about the work that you're doing in that space. And I think that creatives have to do the work in that space. For Um, sure. That's our job. Yes. You said a quote that I that resonates with me a lot. You said, I understood that to be seven years ahead, it's all about fusion. 
Now, my father used to listen to a lot of fusion jazz records back in the day. There were a lot of Donald Byrd records in my house back in the day. And I know that Donald Byrd got back on the road with Guru and us in the hip hop space. We appreciated what Donald Byrd was doing. We were sampling, sampling his music a lot. But those jazz cats were not fucking with him the same way they weren't rocking with Thelonious Monk. He, his music stood the test of time. What do you think is the next wave of fusion that you see coming? Well, I think that a lot of the fusion is going to come from Africa and mm -hmm. South America. Um, a lot of like where we're we going in the next seven years. Um, as you can see, the Afro beat is definitely not slowing down. Um, mm -hmm. And the fusion of trap, the, the origin of like trap, along with it coming from Atlanta, right? The mm -hmm. origin of that sound is a complete fusion of everything, right? Mm -hmm. So when people talk about, I, I mean... Once again, if we define the basic word of hip hop, right? We can't say hip hop without saying jazz fusion, right? Yeah. So let's start with the origin. Jazz fusion translate into everything. So basically a fusion is a mixture of sounds that's put together. And once you're done, it literally sounds like one thing. So as we move forward, we're noticing that Afro Beats is doing that, right? We notice that certain parts of Latin America is doing that. But have you asked yourself, why is hip hop music still the number one music of the world and will continue to be? Because it's fusion That's at right. the end of That's the right. day. It's a collage. Yes. Yeah, so seven years from now, we're going to be at a new form of fusion. And I think a lot of what's happening in Africa and Latin America is going to affect that. Man, this is powerful, brother. Ladies Love. and gentlemen, why Clef John has joined the People's Party. Give it up. Bless families. Bless. Love, Thank you love. so much.